You're listening to the official Temple University Football Coaches Show with Gelbin Chase on Philly's number one college radio station, WHIP. All right, that's us, Philly's number one college radio station, WHIP, 11.30 a.m. here on the East Coast. Eagles play the Chiefs tonight, but we're going to take a quick timeout from the Eagles coverage because it's time for the Temple University Football Coaches Show. And we'll take a look at the offense this week as we welcome in the offensive coordinator for the Temple University Football Owls, and that's Marcus Satterfield. Marcus, it's Zach Gelb and Chase Sr. Thanks for a few minutes. How are you? Doing well. Sitting out on the uh, sitting out on the practice field. We just finished up a uh, good, enthusiastic, physical open week Thursday practice. Well, that sounds great. And this Temple team, they start off 0-3. They're getting off to a little bit of a slow start. Uh, they went up against Fordham, and that was a crushing defeat where they lost in the final seconds by a score of 30-29. to As you enter this first bye week of the season and you have Idaho coming up next, what are some things that you like about this offensive unit so far, and what are some things that need to improve? Uh, the things that, you know, like, like any 0-3 team right now, I'm sure, is saying is, that you know you play the what if game, and that usually means you're zero and three. But uh, we've got to eliminate things that that we self-inflict on ourselves. Uh, you know, too many times our drives are being stopped by a procedure penalty, a holding penalty, a drop ball, a missed assignment. Uh, there's too many of those that are that's going on. Uh, you know, in a game, you're always going to have a missed assignment. You're going to have a stupid, you know, a penalty that somebody's just you know, once or twice a game, maybe tops. Uh, that you can survive. Right now, there's too many for us to be able to survive this early in our, uh, you know, in the progression of us getting our offense going. Uh, the thing I like is when we do get a first down to start a drive, and we do get it going, it usually ends up down inside the 20, whether it's a touchdown or a field goal attempt, or but we're getting down there. It's just uh, to answer your question in a, in a long, <laughs> with a long answer, that we just have to stop killing ourselves. And then there's some, good, you know, there's some good things with the playmakers outside when we're getting it to them. But uh, we've got to be way more consistent than we are right now. I think another big issue is finishing off drives. When you get into the red zone, you want to go out there and put up seven points on the board instead of settling for a field goal attempt. What has been your message to your offensive unit so far as you've already been through three games about once you get inside the 20, really walking away with six or seven points on the board? Yeah, I mean, it's got to be it's got to be um, you know a mentality. Of when we get there, we've got to be able to run the football with more efficiency. You know, we can't run the ball, get it first and 10 on the 18 and run the ball in second and nine, you know, on the 17. We've got to be productive in the run game. Uh, when it becomes a point where we get down there, like against Notre Dame, and we couldn't really move the line of scrimmage and we had to throw it, that gets tough. The field shrinks and, you know, they're, they're able to cover more ground with, with not as much area to have to cover. So we have to be able to run the football and be physical down there it's a, you know what we do offensively. There's not a lot of the big heavy, you know, three tight ends, two back sets that uh, that you see a lot. Of, you know, in the NFL game, and some colleges still do it. But we got to be able to win one-on-one battles up front. And I think once we start doing that, and we're getting closer. Um, I think the, the production in the red zone will be, you know, a lot better. Coach, it's Chase Senior. Thanks for hopping on with us. Connor Riley at times this season has looked really good, and at other times he's obviously struggled, but that's what happens when you, you get a quarterback under center who doesn't have much experience. He's only got one touchdown pass, but when he's been given time, he's shown that he's got a really good arm, he's accurate with his passes, and he's really smart. When he doesn't have his first option, he checks down to his second and third options. But from the offensive coordinator's perspective, what are some things that Connor Riley must work on moving forward to to build on some of the bumps in the road that he's having right now? Really the only negative that I've had with him the entire season is just the the ball security in the pocket. I mean, we worked that you know, from day one of just, you know, understanding when you're moving around, there, there are people, you know, especially in a pocket, not just an open field. Ball security is crucial. You can't have one hand on the ball. You got to keep two hands on the ball. And you got to throw the ball away, and you can't, you know, you, you've got to possess the ball when the whistle blows. And, you know, that's the only times that I've really wanted to strengthen him is just when he's had issues keeping two hands on the ball and being careless. But other than that, the kid is. Uh, you know, going back when you just reevaluate what's going on the first few weeks, you watch your cut ups the first few weeks. He's getting, you know, he's getting, he's getting knocked around pretty good, and he stands in there and he sees it coming. He takes the shot, he delivers the ball. Um, I'm very happy with where he is, and you know, he came in. There's no way 
really – I mean, he shouldn't have played against Fordham. And he basically told Coach Rowley he was going to kick his butt, you know, if he didn't put him in. So we, we let him go in and told him, you know, not to keep the ball. And then he keeps the ball and scores, which is a good play. But, you know, we tried to protect him. He went in there and he operated the system. He got the, you know, got the ball out of his hands quickly, was accurate, got completions and scored three touchdowns. I think the total – the three touchdowns he was in there that scored out of three possessions was – a total of under, like, I think six six minutes forty seconds somewhere yep. around there. So. Now, when uh, last week, uh, obviously Juice Granger gets a start. PJ Walker also saw, saw some time as well. How banged up was Connor? Was was it the the coaching staff just trying to save his leg and, and avoid any further injury, or and and kind of save him heading into the bye week, or uh, did you, were you guys confident in Juice and PJ? No, we were very confident in Juice and PJ, but. It was a situation where we didn't really know. We couldn't t- say, "All right, Juice, you know, go go play, uh, Connor. Don't dress out. You know, we'll put PJ in." Because we didn't know at the time. You know, it's a it's a decision you got to make with PJ being a freshman. You know, with a red shirt and everything. What it's a touchy situation, and when you put him in, if you don't put him in, um, you know, if Juice doesn't struggle. It's not an issue. If Juice struggled or got hurt, what would we do? So you know, we put Connor in pads instead. If it's an emergency, we're going to put you in there, and you can hand the ball off. Because all week he's saying, I can do it, you know, I can do it. And we'll go through quarterback individual, and he looked, it hurt me. Like, I would stop, like, stop. You know, he couldn't move. And he had a bone bruise and an AC, something sprain and a high ankle sprain and just couldn't move. And um, so we went into it saying, this, I mean, this kid needs a break, one, so he doesn't hurt it any worse. You know, if he goes out there and plays 70 snaps, is he going to, will he tear something? Well, you know, will something break? So we wanted to give him a couple of weeks of rest and we had all the confidence in the world and juice to get it done and we just we struggled and as you know in anything you know if you're struggling you got to change it up a little bit if you're playing golf and you can't hit the ball for the tee you go buy a new driver so that's the decision we made at halftime is all right pj let's go with it you know and once we do that and you got to commit to pj to, to you know getting ready to play the rest of the year whether it be uh, you know a substantial amount of time or backup time whatever it may be we've committed to that and then uh Connor comes in at the end. Thank goodness he threatened to, you know, to beat somebody up on the sideline to get in, and we let him go in, and he ends up at least giving us a chance to win the game. But we had no intention of him playing a snap. Marcus Satterfield joins us on the hotline. This is the Temple University Football Coaches Show with Gelbin Chase on Philly's number one college radio station, WHIP. And, Coach, I remember when Matt Rule took the job here. He came into our studio, and they said they were moving to the pro spread, and they want to throw the football compared to where in styles of the past regimes that have been here at Temple University, it's been that Temple tough run kind of approach. And then he also said when he wants fans to get to the stadium early and sit down for the first play, not knowing what to expect. You saw some trickery in that uh, in that Houston game where they took a deep shot early on in that game on the first play, and it was intercepted. Do you want to see some more big plays from this offensive unit as the season continues to move forward? Yeah, we have to. to you know, we and it's my responsibility to get it going. You know, I've, we've got to push the ball down the field and take more shots, and, and we can't just nickel and dime people to death because when you do that, you're asking. Uh, you know, people. you're asking guys that are in the first year of any type of offense like they're in now compared to where they've been in the past to put together, you know, 12, 13 plays and score a touchdown without screwing up. And chances are, you know, 13 plays, they're gonna, we're going to find a way to mess it up and install a drive. So we've got to be able to get balls down the field and score quickly. Uh, and, you know, that's a focus that we're, that we're looking at currently and we're going to you know, really make a commitment to – not come out of a game where we're not put, at least giving our guys a chance to you know to run by somebody and catch the ball and, and push the defense. I've been really impressed with Chris Coyer's transition from quarterback to tight end. He's got 10 catches on the year for 90-plus yards, caught a touchdown pass last weekend against Fordham. He's looked good when the ball's been thrown to him. He's shown that he's had really good hands. Do you plan on implementing him more in the offensive game plan moving forward because he's making a smooth transition from that quarterback position to tight end? Yeah, I mean, I trust, like, I, you know, if you're ranking the offensive people that you trust to, you know, make a play in a crucial crucial situation, yeah, he's one of the top one or two. I mean, I know, like the other day, we, you know, we the touchdown that he caught, we, you know, we called a play, we called, you know, something in our offense, and we just line up and we say, set hot, and see what the defense is in. We looked at the sideline, and I saw it was man coverage, and the first person, I, you know, I was like, Chris will win. Here we go. And, you know, I didn't hesitate a bit. 
you don't think about is he's never really played that position, much less it's his third game playing that position. And we're getting ready to ask him to win on a route versus man coverage, and uh, and catch. You know, he caught a ball that had crossed the guy's face in man coverage. It was, you know, it was a, it was a, a, I don't know if you know, it's a wrist catch where there was no body involved. He had to stick his hands out with the guy on top of him and make the play. Uh, very to say I'm pleased with where Chris Coyier is uh, is an understatement. And, you know, as you said, I think, you know, as the weeks go on, his role will keep, you know, growing and growing and growing. Coach, another big potential prospect for this team has been Dion Miller. Uh, he has that six five frame, which a lot of other of your wide receivers are more on the smaller side. Uh, how important is it to go out there and get Dion Miller going? Because especially when you're inside the 20s, he could be a lethal force for your football team. Right. And, we, you know, we tried to get it to him twice the other day, and he got one, you know, one at the end of the, in the third quarter. The guy had to grab him, and uh, we got a pass interference, which set up a touchdown. Uh, so, you know, as, again, he's you know, he's getting in shape. Uh, had some hydration issues early on in camp where he didn't get to practice as much, so he's getting back within the offense. And his role, again, will grow and grow as, as everybody will. In a new offense, you know, every week is a week they're older, and, you know, one more week that they're into it. So you're right 100 percent once we get down there at least he gives you a size mismatch where you can throw a ball up and he can he can go up and get it which he's done in the past zaire williams has come in and done a really nice job at, at running back in the backfield he leads a team in carries currently and we all knew that he was a, a slash and dash back he could go outside of the tackles uh, shake and bake make a couple of nice moves and make some defenders miss but he's also shown that he can run in between the tackles and, and he's a really tough runner how high of a ceiling does he have, given that he is only a true freshman and still has three years of eligibility after the season? Uh, you know, he's got a tremendous amount of potential, which you know still doesn't mean anything. Uh, but you know, if he continues to work and show the same work ethic that he shows every day since you know he's been with us, and uh, you know, as long as he st- you know keeps the great attitude that he has, uh, the sky's the limit. But um, you know, he's. he's I would say he's been a pleasant surprise, but that's kind of what we expect him to do. You know, early on, kind of ease him into the game against Notre Dame, keep getting him some more carries, and then, you know, hopefully by game four and five, then he's getting it even more and being as productive as he is now. But that was a really good game he had at the end of the sporting game, just getting in space, finding the seams, you know, getting us some big, you know, 12, 14, 18-yard runs. Coach, your own three to start off the season. No one wanted to get off to this start, and you have some players that have been struggling. One's been Jim Cooper Jr., who's missed a bunch of field goals. Just as a coach, how do you keep a player's confidence up after starting out 0 and 3 and just trying to get that first win on the schedule? It's not easy. Um, you have to, you know, the, the worst thing you can do is start trying to make them feel good. <laughs> you know, you can't sit there and oh, it's all right, guys. It's we'll get it you know you have to keep your thumb down and you have to keep pressing and you have to explain the process of you know there's a there's a time when Alabama before Nick Saban got there was two and four and there was a time when you know Nick Saban was there they had a losing record in a season before he got it going um it's a process that you know it's a, it's a mentality shift even though Matt was here with you know coach Golden they've been gone for a year or two um it's a mentality shift it's a organizational shift of you know the thought process behind what we do things we try to show the kids you know this is how we're going to do them uh we're all in three guys we're not going to panic and change things you know that's we're not going to be reactive to the situation that's stupid to go well we're all in three let's change this and start really focusing on uh this more you know you should have been focusing on that earlier and that's what we try to do is this is what we do every week we'll make adjustments personnel wise based on how kids are playing are they committed? Are they doing what they're supposed to be doing? If they are, great. If not, we'll you know we'll maneuver some situations, manipulate the situation, get the right people in the game. Other than that, we'll just stay the course. You know, and don't look at the initial oh it's zero and three. Let's panic change. You know, look look at it individually from okay we're zero and three. We got next practice. Let's get better. Next practice. Let's get better. Which leads you into the next game. You know, and just try to take it step by step. Lay out the process for them, and, and you know you just. Keep being demanding. Don't let them slip up, and hope they've end a result. And you know, by the end of the season, the fortune of the tide is turned, the fortunes have changed, and we got more wins and losses. Coach, we appreciate a few minutes today. Have a great weekend, and uh, hopefully, we do see a win up against Idaho coming up in two weeks. We appreciate a few minutes today. <laughs> Thank you.
and, and I appreciate you being nice. Said it's it's not a great start. It, the start we've got right now sucks, and we're, <laughs> mad, and we're going to get it fixed. And uh, the student section is unbelievable, unbelievable. My wife, we we grew up in the South, SEC type people, and Tennessee games and Auburn games, and this our student section is awesome, and our band is awesome. So. We'll work our butts off, and we'll get it fixed. I just want them to keep coming out, and we'll give them a good product to, to come see. Coach, believe me, we firmly believe that this program is headed in the right direction, and that's a consensus around a lot of this fan base. So just keep plugging away. We believe in you guys. We sure will. Y'all have a great day. All right. All right, we've reached the, almost the end of the show. we got uh, about 12 minutes to go here. Philly's number one college radio station, WHIP. Two great back-to-back segments right there with Ian Rappaport of the NFL Network and Temple Offensive Coordinator Marcus Satterfield. you got to love Coach Sat just because he tells you how it is. Tells you, you how it is straight up. You get those coaches' answers sometimes of, we just got to get better, and then it's really like, okay, well, what do you have to get better at? He told you what they have to get better at. They have to finish inside the 20. They have to make some field goals. They have to go out there and open up some more big plays. And he let it known to the student fan base right now. Keep on coming out to the game. The band, keep on coming out. We're going to get better. But right now, we suck. I got to love that from a coach. You could tell that he was pissed off about what happened against Fordham. Yeah. And this team wants to get on the field and go up against Idaho. The coaching staff that Matt Rule has assembled Fire. is awesome. A lot of fiery guys, very intense guys that want to get after it on a daily basis, guys that enjoy going to Edberg Olson Hall every single day, studying tape, studying the game, seeing what they can do and improve on moving forward. They love going out on Chodoff Field and coaching their respective units. And that's why I believe that this program is headed in the right direction. Obviously, the players have to take care of business on the field. They're the ones that decide what happens on the scoreboard. But the coaches love doing their job. They have passion, intensity, and fire. And especially in Philadelphia, a city that loves football and loves tough, gritty football, uh, what a coaching staff to, that Matt Rule assembled at Temple University.